So to recap on hash functions, we have some function that takes some usually arbitrary size input, any length input m, and it produces a fixed size, usually small, output h, the hash value. And we said about some of the properties. Uh, the two main things that we care about is the one-way property and collision-free property. That is, this function, to use it for security purposes, depending on how we're going to use it, but two properties of interest. One is that it should be easy to take the hash of a message, but it should be hard to calculate that message from the hash. That's the one-way property. Going one way using the function is easy. Going the in opposite way, calculating the inverse of the function should be hard. Hard in terms of it would take forever to do it. That's what we mean by hard in this case. Computationally infeasible. And another property is that we know that if we have an input which is larger than the output, if the length of the input is larger than the length of the output, then there are possible inputs that will map to the same output. So we know in theory there may be collisions. That is, two different inputs produce the same hash value. But in practice, for security reasons, we, sh we require the collision-free property. It's not that there will not be collisions. It's that it will be very hard to find two messages that will produce a collision. Okay, from the security of the algorithm, we require that for an attacker, it's practically impossible then for them to find two messages that do map to the same hash value. We know there are messages that map to the same hash value. There must be. But finding them should be hard. And that's, we'll see the role of that, those two properties when we see hash functions used in different security mechanisms. Hash functions are used in, in different places. We will see in today we'll see them used in digital signatures for authentication. So like signing something to prove that it came from you, but using on 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 digital data. And in when we finish this topic eventually, we'll move on to user authentication, like storing passwords. And again, we'll see hash functions arise there. And they have different property requirements, but uh, We'll see hash functions are used in a number of different security mechanisms. So, we're not going to go into details of how the functions work. Uh, this is just one example that we can use hash functions for authentication by combining it with symmetric key encryption. And the example shows that the way to read this diagram is we take a message M so on the, the sender, on the left side, has a message M, and they want to send that to the receiver B, and they want B to be able to be sure that nothing's been modified along the way and that it actually came from the sender A. And we went through a procedure last week where we can do that just with symmetric key encryption, just by encrypting the message. But another alternative is to take a hash of the message so here we have this function h, uppercase h. We take the message, take a hash of the message, and instead of encrypting the entire message, we encrypt the hash value. So we apply our encryption function e, taking a shared secret key k, and encrypt the hash value. What is this operator? Anyone? No. The, the one with the two bars there. What operator? Pause. No. Any other attempts? Concatenate. We usually use that to, to join two things. So we're talking about sending messages. The, the way to read this diagram is that we... This is happening at the source user. Concatenate is to take... We take the message M. We apply a function on M. So we take the hash of m, the output of this hash function will be the hash value. And an important practical characteristic here is the m may be, the message m may be very large. Maybe it's a, a 10 megabyte file. When we take the hash of the message, we get a short fixed size hash value as output. Maybe 128 bit hash value. 
So we only encrypt the hash value. So that has some practical benefits because encrypting in small things is much faster than encrypting large files. So rather than encrypting the entire file, we just encrypt the hash value using a shared secret key K and we take the encrypted hash value and attach it to the message. Join them together, concatenate is that operation. And send both of them across the network to B. So what does B receive? They receive this. So it's really split into two parts. One is the original message. And two, they receive the hash of that message but encrypted with a key K. The purpose of this scheme is authentication. What B does is they want to check, is the message that I received correct? Well, by correct I mean, has it been modified along the way? And did it come from A? Or did it come from someone pretending to be A? He wants to know whether something's been changed. And how it checks is that it takes the received message, M, calculates the hash of that using the same hash function that A used, and takes the received second part, this encrypted part, decrypts it using the same key K, and then they compare the results. And if they are the same, B accepts this message. It assumes nothing's gone wrong. If they are different, then it assumes something's gone wrong. And it doesn't trust the message. First, a simple question. Does this scheme provide confidentiality? What is confidentiality? Keep your message secret. Does this scheme provide confidentiality? No. no, why not? The message itself is not encrypted in this case. So this is not intended to keep the message secret. This is only intended to, for the receiver B to detect whether something's gone wrong in the communications. It doesn't matter if someone sees the message. And often we, we need that as a service. That is, we don't care if someone sees the message. I just care that the message I receive is, in fact, the one that was sent. So the message is not encrypted, so there's no confidentiality. How could an attacker modify the message and it go undetected at the receiver? What could the attacker do? Anyone want to put on their black hat and think, what would you do as an attacker to try and fool the receiver B into thinking the message they receive has not been modified. What can you do? You're an attacker, what are you going to do to try and trick the receiver B? What about trying changing the message? All right, let's say with authentication, we, we often think of two things, two parts of authentication data integrity and source authentication. Data integrity is to make sure that the message I receive, when I say I, user B receives, I want to make sure it hasn't been modified along the way. It maintains its integrity. Also, I want to make sure that the message I received did in fact come from A. It didn't come from someone pretending to be A. So we want to provide those two services and we call them authentication in general. Let's consider what the attacker could do in this case. And I'll write it a little bit briefer than what that picture captures, just to save a bit of time. The idea was that A is sending a message to B. And what does A send? The message and the message and the encrypted hash. Okay? The message concatenated with the hash of the message encrypted with key K. So I'll write down what they send. So they send the message and we can write it as M concatenated 
with the encrypted hash of that message. That's what's sent across the network. The two bars mean concatenation, just join them together. If M is a thousand bits and the second part is a hundred bits, we just attach them together and send the, the 1,100 bits. The hash of the message, usually a small value. For example, if we use MD5, it's 128 bits. Yes, 128 bits, I have to think. SHA uses 160 bits or sometimes longer. And to encrypt the hash, what length will the ciphertext be? If I encrypt a 128-bit hash value, how long will the ciphertext be, the output of the encryption? The same. Okay, normally when we encrypt plain text, the ciphertext that comes out is the same length. So the encrypted part here would be quite small if we have a large message. And the key, K, maybe I should have made it clearer, but uh, let's think of it as KAB. Remember, shared between A and B, uh, not much space. That's the secret key shared between A and B. Only A and B have it. They send this across the network. Let's say someone intercepts that message before it gets to B. Our malicious user intercepts the message and they're going to change it forward on to B with the intention that B, when they receive it, will think it's from A and think it hasn't been modified. That's the goal of the attacker. Make B think the message it received is from A and the message they received is exactly the same as what A sent. As the malicious user, we want to modify the message and hope B doesn't notice. So let's consider some different ways in which we can modify it. The first approach, let's just modify the message. And we'll denote it as what we send is, I'll write it here, instead of sending M, I'll denote it as M prime. Okay. A sent the message M, maybe the message was uh, decrease the malicious user's salary by one million baht. The malicious user changes that message to increase. Okay, so when I say M prime here, I mean something different than the original M. M prime. Let's say they change that and they keep the rest the same. We'll try some different options in a moment, but let's say that what the malicious user does is changes the first part but keeps the remaining part the same. And then forwards it on to B. For example, let's say the message was uh, 1,000 bits in length and the encrypted part was 128 bits. So in total we have 1,000 bits plus 128 bits in length. All the malicious user does is change the sum of the bits in the first 1,000 and the last 128 bits they send as is. They don't modify. They don't in fact encrypt. They just take those bits, whatever they were, and attach them to the new message. They send that to B. What does B do? B decrypts what they receive in the second part to try and check. So they do some verification. So really they do two steps at B. They I'll write it down here. Step one, we you're correct, we, we encrypt a decrypt, but we also, I'll write it first, we also take a hash of the received message. So we do two steps. We received M prime, B did, so the first step is take a hash of that. The second step is 
to decrypt the second half of that message, or the second part. Decrypt using which key? What key do we decrypt with? The same key, key A, B. We think the message is from B, uh, from A, so we decrypt with a key that we've shared with A. What do we decrypt? This second part. And I'll write it in full if I can find the space. H of M, I'm going to run out of space. You'll do it better. And there's one more bracket there, is there? Yes. Two steps. Take a hash of the received message, so we treat the message in two parts. The received part, or the received message, and the encrypted hash value. Take a hash of the received message, M prime, and decrypt the second part. And because it's from A, we decrypt with a key we've shared with A. And what happens when we decrypt? What do we get as an output? When we, let's see what we're doing here. The hash of M encrypted with key KAB all of that decrypted with key KAB gives us what's the value here? Not M. No, no. What did we encrypt? The hash of M. So we, inc we inc this part is the encryption of the hash of M with key KAB. So therefore, if we decrypt that ciphertext with key a KAB, our rule or our assumption is if we encrypt it with some key and decrypt it with the same key, we'll get the original input back. That's our requirement for encryption. You encrypt a message with a key, you decrypt that ciphertext, you must get the original plain text back. So H of M was encrypted, encrypted with KAB, all of that decrypted with KAB returns H of M, the hash of the message. So these are the two steps that B does to try and verify. First, hash the received message, H of M prime in this case. Second, decrypt the, the second part. And since we're encrypting and decrypting with the same key, we assume that what we'll get out when we decrypt is the correct plaintext, i.e. hash of M. Step three, compare them. Compare the results of step one and two. Are they equal? Does the hash of M prime equal the hash of M? Now I've got a third step. There's, there are three steps. We, the comparison is a simple step. All right, just look at the two. We hash the received message, decrypt the encrypted hash value, then compare the results. And the result of the first step was hash of M prime. The result of the second step was hash of M. Are they the same? And why or why not? Does the hash of M equal the hash of M prime? No. Why not? Because assuming we have a good hash function, our property or of our hash function is the hash of two different messages produces two different values. Since M and M prime are different, because the malicious user modified M to get M prime, then the hash of the two values should be different. So they will not be equal, and that tells B something's gone wrong. So they're not equal, 
and that's a trigger to B to, uh, I'll write, don't trust it. B knows not to trust that message, so it treats it as compromised. If they are equal, trust it. If they don't, don't trust it. So it's a verification procedure. This has failed the verification. How do we know the hash is not the same? How does B know when they calculate the hash, come back to our properties of hash functions? For a secure hash function, we, we have this requirement of collision-free property. We require it to be not possible or practically impossible for someone to choose two different messages, M1 and M2, that produce the same hash function. So if that's true, if no one can find two messages that produce the same hash function, Therefore, when we hash two different messages, they must give a different hash values. So, assuming that our hash function will produce different hash values for different inputs, then the hash of M prime and the hash of M must be different. Correct. This hash of M is what A created. Okay. Because we decrypted with the correct key, from last week we said if we encrypt with one key and decrypt with that same key, we will get the original input. Everything will work okay, which we did. So we get hash of M, and since M doesn't equal M prime, the hash of M prime does not equal the hash of M. And this is an indicator of why we need this property for hash functions. If the attacker could find a message M prime that was different and the hash values were the same, this wouldn't work. So such a scheme relies on the property of collision-free hash functions. So it's an example of why we need that property. The logic here gets a bit confusing, so try and follow along and ask questions when you don't capture it. This is, just to be clear, this is what B is doing. Okay, B is doing this. We need to... This picture shows us both what A and B do. On the left is A, on the right is B. The idea was we don't encrypt the entire message. There's no encryption of the message, so we don't have confidentiality. What B does, we see here, B receives everything, but it's really broken into two parts. The message received, the top part, and the encrypted hash value. We see the two steps it does, hash of M, decrypt, and compare, step three. The idea is verifying, checking that what we receive is okay. Correct. <laughs> if, you, if you go back to what we did last week, do we have a picture? That's not the point. Uh, this one. We went through this one last week where we encrypt the entire message. 
This scheme provided three services. Confidentiality. The message is encrypted. Okay, no one can see the message in this case. But it also provides data authentication or data integrity. If the message is modified, we'll be able to detect with this scheme. And source authentication in that if someone fakes a message, sends it saying they're from A, we'll detect that. So this scheme, using just symmetric key encryption, provides both the same, ser the same services as our new scheme, but it also provides confidentiality. Our new scheme, which we just went through, does not provide confidentiality. So we may think it's worse than the previous one. But the main benefit of this is we only encrypt a small value. Okay, imagine your message is a, a 10 gigabyte file. Taking, encrypting something is, takes a long time uh, with, with such a large piece of data. So instead of doing that, we take a hash of that file and just encrypt the hash value, a very small value. And that can make uh, the performance much better in this case. So just encrypting the hash value can perform much better than encrypting the entire file especially when we don't need to encrypt the file. We don't care if someone sees the message. What we care about is that no one fakes the message. So that's this, where this alternative is considered better than the previous one. So it's just an al another way to do it. Not only do we have a, a lecturer who doesn't <laughs> speak Thai, we have students that don't speak Thai, so feel free to ask questions and we'll answer for everyone. That's okay. <laughs> Take, take the message. A has a message. They want to send to B. They want, they want B to be able to prove that it came from A and to be able to prove that it wasn't modified along the way. One way to do it, this is just one way to do it. There's others. Okay? One way to do it is to take a hash of that message and, and one benefit of taking a hash is that we what we're going to encrypt next is very small compared to the message. So take a hash of the message and encrypt just the hash value. Okay, that's what we do at A. We encrypt with a key that we've shared with B in the past. Send that to B. And what B will do when they receive is verify. And the verification steps are always the same. Take the hash of the message you receive. So you receive two parts really, the message and the encrypted hash value. The role of B is to take the hash of the received message, decrypt the second part, and then compare them. And the rule is, if they're the same, trust it. If they're not the same, don't trust it. Why does it work? Well, in this case, we see that if someone in the middle tries to modify the message, the malicious user tries to change M to M prime. They want to perform an attack What's the name of such an attack? Mod starts with M, the name of this attack. <laughs> they want to modify the message. It's called a modification attack. Okay, not a hard one, this one. They're just changing the message. But they don't change the second part. They don't try. We'll see another way where they do in a moment. But they don't train the change the second part. So B takes a hash of the received message, decrypts the second part, compares them, and because of our properties of hash functions, the hash of two different messages will diff produce two different hash values. B detects something's gone wrong.
No, because uh, the message can be anything, okay? The message can be anything, okay? So um, you can think of any example, any example. It can be a one word or it can be one gigabyte. Okay. 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 I don't know if it will work fully, but let's try an encrypt a message. Here's our message. That's our message. Okay. That's M. What do we do first? I'm going to send. I take a hash of that. Uh, MD5 is the name of a hash function. So MD5 sum on that file takes a hash of that actual message. There's the hash value. Okay? That's the hash value so far. So we have M and hash of M. We're, we'll just move across so you can see a little bit more. More. So, we've got two parts, M and hash of M. The next thing is we encrypt the hash value. Can I encrypt that? Let's encrypt the hash value. That's the hash. And encrypt. I'm using des. And I need a key. What key do we use to encrypt? We use the key shared between A and B. And I'm just making up a value here so we can put one in. Here's a random key I've chosen as user A. And let's assume B has it as well. Turns out this algorithm needs another value called an initialization vector, but not so important for this. We'll just wrap it around. IV. The values here don't matter. Notepad's not so important. We've encrypted. Do you want to see the encrypted? If you look at that encrypted file, you'll just see it's random looking bits, okay? OpenSSL we saw in a previous demonstration is how to, or is a software to encrypt. <coughs> encryption software, encryption. OpenSSL encrypt, minus E means encrypt. Take this input file, produce an output file. Encrypt the hash. So we have, we've done this step. Okay, we started with a message, we took the hash of the message, we encrypted the hash of the message, encrypted with a key, what do we do next? How do you concatenate? Just concaten, just join them, put them both in the same file for example, they're just two sequences of bits. Let's say the message goes first and the encrypted part goes second, as long as both sides know and agree. Either way, it doesn't matter. So we send the both. So I think we send the both to B. What does B do? What does B do? Decrypts the message. De uh, decrypts the encrypted part. Okay. So we take, so now we're B. We use some software to decrypt, the minus D to decrypt. 
What's the input? Encrypted. Okay. We took the hash, encrypted it, and got this value. So now at B, we're going to decrypt, minus D. Here's the value we're going to decrypt. No, this is the hash which was encrypted. We haven't touched the message at B yet. Okay. This is taking the encrypted hash value and as the output, let's call the output uh, decrypted. We'll look at it in a moment. What key do we use? We should this use the same that we used to encrypt. And the same initialization vector. Not so important. Correct. See, we receive the message plus the encrypted hash. The picture shows that. And we separate them. The, ha the message goes this direction. The gray box here goes down this direction. And now in, we're, we're doing this part. Decrypt, decrypt the received encrypted part. I hope this works. We get a file. That's the contents of the file. Okay, that's the contents of decrypting the received encrypted part. What do we do next at B? What does B do now? Last step, almost the last step. Compare. Almost the last step. Before we compare, compare what? So we've decrypted, we get this value. We need to take the hash of the receive message. Now let's assume that the message hasn't been modified, so we'll take the hash, MD5 sum of the receive message, and the receive message in this case is the same as the original message. Okay? What have I done wrong? Are they the same? This is the decrypted value we got. This is the hash value we got. Are they the same? Yes, they're the same. Therefore, we trust this message. In this case, the message wasn't modified. It was the original one. I didn't change anything. If you change the message, let's change the message, plain text. Hello, change, remove the dot, and replace it with a space, just change one character. Take the MD5 sum now, it's a different hash value. Okay. If the message was modified, the hash value will not be the same as the decrypted hash value. And that's how we know that something's gone wrong. And that's what happened in this example. We did modify the message, therefore the hash values didn't match. In our picture, no, this, these, these uh, almost squares are operations. The hash operation. The input to this function, h, is m. The output is a hash value. The input to the encryption is a hash value and a key. The output is ciphertext. The input to this H is a message. And the input of the decryption function is the encrypted hash value. If you create right. 
in in this case the so in the example whether it's a file or not doesn't the file name doesn't matter it's the contents so if the two if the contents of the files in my example are identical we'll get the same hash value if they're different contents then it will be a different hash value it's the contents the file name doesn't matter How are you going to defeat this? What else can you do? As the malicious user, what could you do? This one didn't work for the malicious user. They tried to change the message. B detected that. So from the attacker's perspective, the attack was unsuccessful. Could the attacker do something else to try to be successful? What could they try? What do we assume? That they don't know the key. Okay, so we assume that the attacker doesn't know the secret key KAB because otherwise it wouldn't be secret. So they cannot know the key. So what could they try, the attacker? They could modify the message like we did here. And instead of sending the, the same as what A sent in this part, they could try to take the hash of the modified message and encrypt it with what key? Malicious user? Any key except KAB. So that's the problem. I think if you follow it through, you'll see it still will not work because if we change the hash value, we need to encrypt that again with a key and our assumption is that malicious user doesn't know KAB. Right? If they did, then the attack would be successful, but we assume that they don't know the, the secret. So, let's do it. Let's try what the malicious user could attempt to do. Modify the message. Modify the second part. So take the hash of that modified message, M prime, encrypt it with what? Any K except KAB. Okay, they don't have KAB. The key of the malicious user, for example. Modify the message. Recalculate the hash of that modified message. Encrypt with a different key, the one that they know. Send that to B. What does B do? Step one. Step one, the other order. Hash. You're correct, but I will do it in a different order. Hash of the received message, hash of M prime. This is what B is doing. Step two, decrypt the received part. Decrypt this part. And decrypt, I'll decrypt what? Or well, decrypt the second part. And I'll just rewrite that. Step one, hash this part. Step two, decrypt this part. Decrypt with what key? What will B decrypt with? Which key? B thinks the message came from A. Therefore, I'll use the key that I've shared with A, KAB. What's the output? What do we assume? What goes wrong here? We've got some plain text. Encrypted with one key. We try to decrypt it with a different key, the wrong key. Our assumption is when we do that, what we'll get is not the plain text, it's some, something else. 
So what we get will not be hash of m prime. Think of it's some other string sequence of bits, but we know if we encrypt with one key and decrypt with the wrong key, the output would not be the plain text. Okay, that was our assumption for encryption. Actually, we'll get something that's recognizably wrong usually, but it will not be the in the plain text. Okay. Well, it doesn't matter what we get, except that it's not hash of m prime. So it will not be hash of m prime. So I'll write instead of equal to. We know for sure it will not be hash of m prime that we get out here. I don't know what we get, but I do know that it will not be this. So step three, we compare whatever the values are, and we'll see that. Let's say we call this x. Uh, the output of this was x, some value. We compare x with hash of m prime. They're not equal. Decrypting using the wrong key will not produce hash of m prime. Therefore, when we compare to the hash of m prime, they are not equal. Okay. Good. Right. This, so maybe I've written this not so clearly, but what do we get out of this decryption? Let's call it x. Okay. Some value comes out x. Then we compare this value x with this value. And we want to know, are they the same? And I know that they are not the same because we know that if we had an input of hash of m prime, encrypted with one key, Decrypted with another key, the output will not be the hash of m prime. Because that's our assumption. If we decrypt with the wrong key, we will not get the original input. Therefore, x is not hash of m prime. Therefore, we verify, we check that this is a wrong uh, message. Something gone wrong. We don't trust. So this scheme, what we've gone through is two cases where the attacker tries something, but we detect it. And that's how authentication works. We cannot stop someone pretending or sending a fake message or modifying a message, but we can detect if they do. Detection is important. Any more questions? I don't have an example to do on the screen, but does this... Uh, last questions before we move on? 100% clear? Good. All right. We will see some other very similar cases as well. So we'll, we'll repeat this, but in a slight variation. What have we got? Let's move on and then we'll see another variation of this so you'll get some more practice. Different hash algorithms. The two main ones are MD5, created by Ron Rivest. His name will come up later. Generate 128-bit hash value. It's no longer considered secure. What that means is that those properties that we talked about, the one-way property and the collision-free property, it turns out with this hash function now it is possible to, for people to find collisions. Hard, but uh, can, no longer can 
recommended, no longer considered secure. There are attacks on MD5. But it still seems to be used a lot. Secure hash algorithm has gone through different iterations, SH SHA-1, SHA-2, SHA-3. And with SHA-2, there's actually different length hash outputs. OK, let's, let's get through hash functions so we can move on to the next part. Which one is more secure, MD5 or SHA? SHA, SHA is a bit confusing. SHA has different variants. SHA-1 is not. The original version, SHA-0, even older than that. But SHA-2 is considered secure. And in SHA-2, there are different length hash outputs. So there's SHA with a 224-bit output, or a 256, or a 384, or a SHA-512. That is the length of the hash value. They're generally considered secure for most applications. So SHA is, is still commonly used. There are others, but those are two popular ones you'll see. That's a little bit more theory about the attacks, but we uh, on the properties. But we've said enough about the properties. Where are they used? In many different security mechanisms, we see hash functions. So just in the the left column, we'll see shortly they use for digital signatures. So we'll explain what that is and see how they use. They use for intrusion detection. So if for a network or a computer system trying to detect uh, are there uh, people who have gained access to that system that shouldn't. Hash functions are used there. And in virus detection, to detect if there's some virus attached to some application, hash functions are used to compare maybe the infected application with the original uninfected application to check if there's been a change. So hash functions are used in virus detection. We saw Previously, what we went through is a case of hash function used with symmetric key encryption. We'll see, we'll spend some time about passwords. Everyone's seen the password file on a Linux computer? What's it called? What's the name of the file that stores password information in a Linux computer? Not passwd, the other one. Shadow. We haven't seen the contents yet, but it, later, we'll, on one topic, we'll see the contents of that file and we'll see we don't store the actual password, we store a hash of the password. So hash functions come up in different cases. One aspect of hash functions is that it should be hard to find collisions. We said that. In theory, there are collisions. Two different messages produce the same hash value. But the requirement is that, in practice, it's practically impossible for someone to find two different messages that produce the same hash value. And one way that attackers try and do that is that they try many different values. So the security of hash functions depends, uh, in a large part, upon how long it takes to try to hash many different messages. From the attacker's perspective, they find a message, calculate the hash, does it produce the same as the other hash value? If not, try a different message and keep trying. So the speed at which you can calculate hash functions is important. And we'll just do it quickly. On my computer, how fast can I calculate hash functions? Anyone want to guess? How many hashes per second? Let's try. Let's run a speed test on the MD5, for example, one of the, the simpler hash functions. This, my software, OpenSSL, is just calculating hashes. In fact, we'll stop there. It does some more tests. It calculated, what, 6 million hashes in 3 seconds. So that software just went and did a lot of hash, MD5 hashes of random messages. And it did about 6 million in 3 seconds, or about 2 million per second. So my computer can try about 2 million hashes per second. You can actually buy 
more dedicated hardware or hardware that is much faster. And people will do estimates because they're used in many different things. Anyone know the recent GPUs, graphics cards? Anyone bought one recently? What's the latest GPUs available today? Who makes them? What company? No one's got a computer at home? No one's played a game before? Oh, no. Maybe you should change from IT to arts or something. Huh? Come on. What's, what's one of the latest GPUs available? Or a manufacturer? NVIDIA. Okay. Turns out that for hash functions, GPUs, graphics cards, are much faster than your general purpose CPU. My Intel CPU is very slow. I got about 2 million hashes per second. I'll zoom in in a moment. I'll find some of the most recent GPUs. Uh, where? I don't know. I don't, I'm not up to date. But some NVIDIA graphics cards, different models, they can calculate hash functions at about 10 million, uh, 10 billion per second. Okay, so my computer did 2 million per second. Like a graphics card, which is not very expensive, several hundred dollars, can calculate at about 10 billion hashes per second. And in fact, you can buy dedicated hardware that can calculate even a hundred or thousand times faster than that. Why? Because the security of hash functions depends upon how long it takes to be able to find collisions. And the, the best known way to find collisions is to try many different values, to try many different hashes. And therefore, people try to measure and find the hardware that will calculate the fastest. And that we may see some other data uh, in another topic when we look at passwords. So we'll return to hash functions again when we look at passwords. We'll see the relevance of some of these numbers. For now, remember these four points. Variable, variable sized input, M, produces a fixed sized small output hash. That's what our hash function does. For security purposes, we require the property that if we have the hash value, it should be impossible to find the original message. This is the one-way property. And we'll see that when we look at storage of passwords. Another property we desire in certain cases is that it should be hard to find another message, M prime, that produces the same hash value as some existing message, M. If we could, our attack that our malicious user did would have been successful. So it should be hard to find really two messages that produce the same hash value. And in fact, these two points are, are, are variations of that same uh, property. It's hard to find collisions and hard to go backwards with the hash function. Let's try a different topic and then see it applied with hash functions. We've mentioned symmetric key encryption. What, what do we say or what defines symmetric key encryption? Symmetry across what? What's symmetric in symmetric key encryption? The same key. So you think from A and B's perspective, there's symmetry in that they use the same key. It's a shared key system. There's an alternate crypto system called public key encryption or public key cryptography and sometimes called asymmetric key encryption because the two entities A and B use different keys. One of them uses one key to encrypt, the other uses a different key to decrypt. So we'll talk about that and see the role it plays in different security systems. Any questions before we start on this harder topic? Hash functions was the easy part. Any questions before we start on this one? If 
there's no questions, then everyone listen up and we'll continue. Some history, very quickly. Up until about the 1960s, everything was symmetric key encryption. From back to Julius Caesar, the Roman emperor, or whoever he was thousands of years ago, or a long time ago, through to about 1960s, it was all symmetric key encryption. Then uh, different people uh, over a period of 10 or 20 years discovered this new technique called public key encryption. And in fact, the two people who, uh, or in fact, there were two or three people, but two of them got their name to it, that really introduced it to the public were called Diffie and Hellman. Two guys, Diffie and Hellman. And they really designed public key encryption cryptography and, and uh, introduced it to the public, to everyone. Turned out before that some security agencies had invented it but just hadn't released it at that stage. And we'll see Diffie-Hellman have a very basic scheme which is still used today for exchanging secrets. And then not long after, three guys, Raves, Shamir and Edelman, created a public key cryptography algorithm called RSA which is the most widely used algorithm for public key cryptography today. So RSA is very important. So what is a public key crypto system? Remember with symmetric key algorithms we use the same secret key of both encryption and decryption. With asymmetric we use one key for encryption but a different a different but related key for decryption. How do you choose a symmetric key? How do you choose a symmetric key? How would you choose one? Create it? How, but how would you choose one? Is there an algorithm that tells you how to choose one or what do you do? Random is best. Okay, so it's just a symmetric key is just a random, you choose a random number of an appropriate length and tell your friend that. With public key encryption, we don't just choose a random key. There are actually algorithms that tell us create or generate your key. Because now we have two different keys and they need to be related in some way. It can't just be two random keys. We follow some algorithm to choose one of the keys and to calculate the other key. So we can often talk about a key pair And we'll talk about the names of the public, the keys in the key pair in a moment. We will use one key for encryption and one key for decryption. And our requirement is that if we know one of the keys, such as the encryption key, and we know the algorithm and the ciphertext, but if we know one of the keys in the key pair, it should be practically impossible to find the other key in that pair. Okay, so that's an important requirement that when we have two keys, even if the attacker knows one of them, they cannot find the other. But the keys must be related. So they can't just be random values, they need to be mathematically related usually. In some of the algorithms that are popular, it turns out we'll have a pair of keys. We'll use one key to encrypt, the other to decrypt. In fact, we can usually use them in reverse. Use the other to encrypt and one the other to decrypt. All right, that'll come up. You'll see that optional feature in a moment. What do we call the keys? So we have two keys now. We give them names. One's called a public key, one's called a private key. So we talk about a public-private key pair, or just a key pair. And we usually write them instead of K for key, to distinguish between public, public and private, we usually write as PU for public and PR for private. We can't just use P because they start with the same letter. And we talk about that a particular user has a, their own key pair. So user A has their key pair, public key of A and private key of A. Whereas in symmetric key cryptography, a pair of users had one shared key. 
Remember we had KAB, known by both A and B. This is different where each user has their own pair. So I think everyone in the room has their own pair of keys, their own public key and their own private key. As you may guess by their names, the public key can be, can be made public. That is, my public key, I can tell everyone what its value is. Anyone can know it. The private key must be kept secret. So my, my private key, if I tell someone, then the system fails. So my private key I must keep private or secret. And we use the keys in, in different orders to achieve two different things. The two things that we want to achieve are, are written here, secrecy or really confidentiality. And the other one is authentication. So in fact we can use this system for both secrecy or confidentiality and authentication. Let's see how they work in the concept first. So let's say we have a public key encryption algorithm, a public key decryption algorithm. Everyone knows them. The attacker knows the algorithms. And we have a pair of users. So on the left is user A and on the right is user B. And we assume each user has their own key pair. If we want to achieve confidentiality, which means A wants to send a message to B, and A doesn't want anyone but B to be able to read that message. Okay, we want to keep the message confidential. Then the way that we use public key crypto is that we take the message, the plain text, we don't refer to the plain text as P because that's confusing with public and private, so we often refer to the plain text as M, the message. We take the message, we encrypt it using some encryption function using the public key of B. Okay, so if I want to send a message to you and I want that message to be confidential, I use your public key to encrypt it. And I create some ciphertext. So again, we take as input plain text, a key, we produce ciphertext as output. We send the ciphertext, which can be written as encrypt using public key of B of M, we send that to B. What B does when they receive is they decrypt. And to decrypt a message, in this case, we take the ciphertext and use B's private key. Or generally we use the key, or the other key in the key pair. In this case, the plain text was encrypted with PUB, the public key of B, Therefore, to decrypt, we must use the private key of B. And the algorithms must be such that when we do that, we will get the original plain text, the original message M. So some important points here. Every user has their own key pair. PUB, PRB in this case, are the, belong to user B. User A would have its own key pair, but we don't use it in this case. For confidentiality, we send a... We encrypt using the public key of the destination. Let's see what the attacker can do. We have user A, user B. What do they know? B has a key pair. A also has a key pair. We'll write it. We assume every user has a key pair. We want to provide confidentiality. There's an I in there somewhere. We want our message from A to B to be confidential. 
So we take some message and we encrypt. And what we send is we encrypt using B's public key our message and send that to B. To decrypt, B uses its own private key. And our requirement for our encryption and de decryption function is that when we decrypt some plain text message M, sorry, when we encrypt a plain text message M with PUB and then we try and decrypt the result using PRB, the answer must be M, the original message. That's the requirement of the functions. Similar to symmetric key encryption, we said if we encrypt the plain text with one key and then decrypt with the same key, we'll get the original plain text. This is the, the similar requirement. If we encrypt our plain text message M with the public key of B and then we decrypt all of that with the private key of B, then it must deliver the same value of M. So the difference here is that we use not a shared secret key but we use two different keys but they must belong to the same pair PRB and PUB what can the attacker do? the attacker takes a, a copy of the message they want to find M, what do they do? So the attacker has the message, the, the ciphertext, sorry. That's what the attacker knows. That is, in fact, the ciphertext. They don't know the contents, but the output. So their aim is to find M. How do they find M? Decrypt. So we decrypt that. What key do we decrypt with? What key will our attacker decrypt the ciphertext with? Again, private key of who? Private key of who? Whose can it not be? It cannot be the private key of B because the attacker doesn't know the private key of B. So we cannot use the private key of B here because if the attacker knew the private key of B, it would not be private. Okay? By definition, the private key must be known only by B. So our malicious user... So the security depends upon the fact that we can't find PRB. So if we try a different key, such as PR. A or PRC or just some other key, we assume that it will not decrypt. That is, we'll only successfully decrypt if we use the other key in the key pair. Encrypted with PUB, it can only decrypt with PRB. If it was encrypted with PUA, it will only decrypt with PRA. That's our properties of our uh, public key cryptography algorithms. So since the malicious user doesn't know PRB, they cannot find the message. And therefore we achieve confidentiality. That was our aim. Keep the message confidential.
So what could the malicious user do? What their aim, therefore, is to find PRB And there's two basic approaches, brute force. How do we stop brute force? Make it long enough so it would take forever to do it. Okay, so that's easy to stop. Well, the other thing is that the, for this, this decryption step to work, we can't just use any key, PRB and PUB. It won't work that we just use random values. It turns out for that to be successful, we must have related keys. They must be somehow related. And the algorithm will define the relationship between PUB and PRB. So, does the malicious user know PUB? The malicious user does know PUB, by definition. PU is public. So everyone knows PUB. So the challenge is to make it hard for them to find PRB maybe given the public key. So a secure algorithm would be such that even if the malicious user knows the public key and the ciphertext, they cannot find PRB. That's what we require. If they could, it wouldn't work. That is our security would fail. C is ciphertext, sorry, I didn't write it. That's C is just short for all of this, the ciphertext. We assume they always know the ciphertext, they know the algorithms, they also know the public key. It must be practically impossible to find the private key. So the algorithms must be designed such that it's, it's hard to do. And there are algorithms that do that. RSA is a very popular one. That was for confidentiality. That is keeping the message secret. The other way we use public key crypto is for authentication. We don't care if someone sees the message, we care that B can confirm that the message came from A. Look at the difference between the two slides. In the first case, A encrypted using the public key of B, and we decrypt with the private key of B. In the second case, A encrypts with the private key of A and de B decrypts with the public key of A. We swap the keys and use the sources keys in this case. Your homework is to find out why that works. What I mean is, consider this case, try and draw the picture and try and think as the malicious user. In the second case, see what the malicious user can do. Can the malicious user, A, create a message that they pretend to be from A and make B think it comes from A? Can the malicious user masquerade as A? Or can the malicious user modify the message along the way and make B think that the message came from A and has not been modified? So see if the malicious user can do an attack on the authentication using this scheme, and that should derive at, uh, our requirements for our keys. Have a think about that case. We may give you the answer tomorrow and we'll move on and then we'll see how we combine this with hash functions.